Coming up on this edition of the EV Revolution Show, a little bit more feedback on my viewpoint of the Cybertruck. I'm going to talk about a little bit more news about Rivian and more busing stuff. Stay tuned. Well, hello, and thanks for tuning in to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bookcore for episode 70. Wow, I'm getting up there in the numbers, that's for sure. I can honestly say I've surpassed my age quite some time ago in episodes, uh, believe that or not. Thanks for taking the time to tune in to this show. It certainly won't be as long as the last one. We had a lot of news to catch up on. First of all, I just want to say thank you to everybody sending me best wishes for my recovery from my little bout here of pneumonia. I'm about 90%. I'm almost there. Uh, the odd hack cough here and there, and uh, but I'm hanging in, still working, and still trying to get these shows out. So I appreciate your thoughts. Thank you very much. Also want to uh, say thanks for all the comments that came out from the last episode, as I knew that there would be a lot of comments. I'm going to follow up with that right now, and let me get into that. Uh, that last episode is the second highest show that I've had comments on in the history that I've been doing this show since uh, episode eight, actually, is the episode that I've got the most comments. This is the second highest, especially in only a couple of days. It climbed quite a lot. So I do appreciate the comments. Um, I have to tell you that about f it's about 50-50 as far as negative and positive comments, and I knew I would get some negative comments. Um, uh, you know, again, I'm open and realistic folks as far as my viewpoints on any manufacturer. Um, so I will like I will always like to talk about the pros and cons, and I gave you my opinion, which I'm going to elaborate a little bit more about the Tesla Cybertruck. But the comments were were about balance, which was a surprise to me because I thought it'd be a bit more one sided. But it was a good balance of people that really support the Cybertruck and and were against my viewpoints on why I thought it was a miss. And then there were a lot that got where I was coming to. So what I thought just for the first couple minutes of the show is I just kind of re clarify what I was trying to say. And I, I think the first thing I should start out with is my poor choice of words when I said not practical. That I wasn't alluding to the fact that the truck wasn't practical in its own merit from its specs and, and offering that it provides in some of the versatility. So that was a poor choice of words. What, I, what I'm trying to tell you folks and what I meant by that last episode is that I think it was missed because of the, the lack of opportunity or the, the narrowing of the opportunity uh, of the marketplace that Tesla can go after. There's been a lot of talk, of course, on the Cybertruck over the last week or so. Lots of videos. I mean, I can't go to any web website without seeing five or six articles about it uh, on a daily basis. So there's certainly lots of news. And that's good because it brings awareness to the EV landscape once again. And it gets people thinking about alternative choices. So especially people that have pickup trucks or have that have those needs. It gets them thinking. And that's great. I love that kind of advertising because it does get people talking. My viewpoint, though, on the Cybertruck, as I was trying to say, is that I didn't, I didn't, I don't feel that Tesla needed to be a disruptor in this marketplace because this market is already healthy, it's growing, and it's prospering, and it is a tried and true marketplace as far as the platform design goes. You know, I mentioned in the last show that Elon came up and, and said, you know, for the hundred years we've been building pickup trucks like this, but we're going to build it like this. You know, and there and there's certainly merits to both, but I didn't see any reason why you need to change up. Uh, a mass market vehicle that you want to go to production for um, just for the sake of being cool looking or, or having all these great specs. I mean, Tesla could quite have, you know, easily have come out with a body on frame as opposed to the unibody approach, added their magic, which is their, their uh, leading battery management systems and battery architecture, and of course their performance metrics and the engineering going behind that, and really come out with a whiz bang, uh, a, a, normal, more normal design, architectured, body on frame approach. Now, they chose unibody, and I know why, because it's easier to manufacture, so they can save some money, so they can bring the price down, and that's good. We'll have to wait and see if you'll be able to get any of those units at the entry level price that they talked about, but for right now, let's give them the, the benefit of the doubt. So I, you know, there's reasons why, and the stainless steel and all this stuff. I get it. I mean, there's dirt. Uh, there's definitely pros and cons. Uh, but you know, when you look at a, a body on frame construction, if I take you back just a little bit, you know, it it really is. You have this frame that's an all-purpose chassis. 
in pickup trucks, you can put batteries and motors in there. So it will accept that, the traditional frame. Then you put a cab on it, and then you put whatever you want as far as the bed, whether it's a six and a half foot bed, six foot bed, eight foot bed, um, wider. You can, you know, there's all kinds of configurations. And that's what I was trying to say on the show is that going to the unibody approach um, does save obviously some money uh, easier to, easier to repair I actually had a comment from a couple people saying boy this stainless steel unibody that's going to be pretty expensive to repair so true on that now I had the reverse comments where people were saying well my normal you know I, I work in the field uh, I'm a tradesman and I'm always dinging and rubbing and bumping my pickup trucks in the field and they're costly to repair I get it so stainless steel is going to help uh, avoid that type of uh, damage and that type of repair cost but in anything more substantive it's going to be a lot more to expense, uh, a lot more expensive to fix. Never mind, I don't even know the insurability of the Cybertruck, first of all. That's going to be something unique. There are pros and cons to each. And I'm not going to go through, I did some research and looked at some stuff. And it's just so I could I could talk a little bit more about um, some of the differences. And, you know, what I was trying to, again, approach on this subject, folks, is that the marketplace for pickup trucks, especially the, the traditional approach of the body on frame, um, has so many different varieties. You know, I flashed pictures up in the last show about the different different looks of pickup trucks. I mean, coffee trucks, EMS vehicles. I mean, there's all there's there's dozens and dozens and dozens of applications that you can take that base foundation of a pickup truck body on frame approach and modify it to your benefit. So whether it's it's a municipal need for servicing buses or whatever, whether it's an EMS for specific rescue or supply operations, whether it's it's some other maintenance or some other different types of facilities, welding or all this kind of stuff, um, that platform gives you the ability to choose what you want and it broadens your reach into the marketplace. And that's what I was trying to say, folks, is that I think Tesla with the Cybertruck as good as it is spec wise and price wise i get it i understand it folks i'm not discounting that i'm just saying that nissan that excuse me tesla in my opinion has narrowed the opportunity that they can go after in the marketplace because of the design and the approach that they've gone after um, had they gone to the more traditional i think they can go after a bigger slice of the pie and adding their magic to that vehicle would have probably gardenered a big, bigger slice and if you know if they're happy with that great they'll sell some there's over you know uh, six digit reservations that from what i've heard now remember that's a hundred bucks each so that to me that doesn't really mean a lot um you know a hundred dollar deposit is nothing let's see how those convert into sales and we're still two years away everybody's jumping on the bandwagon comparing the tesla cybertruck to the fords and all this kind of stuff of the world but i mean the thing isn't even built folks it's not even available for two years roughly and you know t going on the specs front let me pull up some specs here because you really you really picked my interest with a lot of the feedback so i appreciate that but you know we talked about rivian <clears throat> rivian i think is kind of one of the first catalysts into this pickup truck marketplace as tesla was into the electric vehicle marketplace the 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 car the automobile i think rivian's a big push they're not going to manufacture gobs of their trucks i think the first year they're planning for 40,000 20,000 of each model plus or minus so they're not going to be a huge player in that stance but let's a lot of people threw specs back at me on the comments so let me bring up the rivian r1t pickup truck everybody's had a chance to see that if i now that comes out that starts at 69,000 us that's what the advertised pricing is and people are going oh well tesla starts at 39,900 us Sure, yeah, that's $30,000 difference. I get it. But when you compare specs to specs, they're not even close. So if I if I needed to compare the Cybertruck to the Rivian R1T, I would have to go to the tri-motor variant of the Cybertruck, which starts at 69.9 USD. So now we're pretty well even on price. Specs back and forth are going to be up and down. You know, Rivian has a 400 mile plus range, uh, uh, Tesla 500 plus miles. Um, acceleration 0 to 60 in 3 seconds, Tesla 0 to 60 in 2.9 seconds. If you can distinguish one-tenth of a second, uh, then you're a superman because I certainly can't do that uh, in real life. Not that it matters. You know, the approach angles of Tesla 35 approach, 28 departure, uh, Rivian 34 approach, 30 departure. 
um, excuse me, maximum ground clearance on the Rivian, 14.1 inches, six up to 16 on the Tesla. Um, towing capacity, 11,000 on the Rivian, 14,000 on the Cybertruck tri-motor all-wheel drive. Again, the Rivian being a more cab-on-frame design. Um, and one other thing that people fail to um, remember is that Rivian's architecture is a motor on each wheel. So you'll be able to infinitely more control torque and power vectoring to those wheels in applications even a little bit better than Tesla with a three motor design, two on the rear axle, one on the front. So there are, there are uniquenesses there. So when you, when you strip this down, um, you know, as far as some of the specs, and I'm not going to get into all the specs because there's tons, you can look these up, but Rivian's a very comparable truck to the Cybertruck. So I think people got lost in the emotion of te that is Tesla and the excitement and the uniqueness that Tesla brings to the marketplace. And what I was trying to do is just bring a voice of reason on the last show. So hopefully I've been able to, you know, with this little added segment, add a little bit more information to you. Um, you know, I made a comment about the big three not being <laughs> worried. Uh, and I still think that that's the case. I mean, you know, Ford, GM, Dodge haven't even come out yet with, you know, fully announced their electrified version of any pickup trucks, which they will within the next year. Um, remember, there's over 90 million vehicles sold globally last year. Uh, out of that, 2.5, 2.3%, I think about 2.5 million were EVs. So it's a huge market. And I've talked about these numbers before. Globally last year, Tesla sold 245,000, just over 245,000 units globally. It's all their vehicles together. Ford, 5.5 million. GM, 8.4 million. FCA, uh, so Chrysler uh, and those guys, 1.56 million. So we're talking about, the when I say the big three, I really mean the big three when you look at sales. Now, yes, they have lots of different models and they have lots of different models in different regions that they reach out to and so forth. But these are big, big companies that can do a lot of what Tesla can do from, an, especially more so from an economy of scale. You know, Tesla hasn't even built a line for this yet or anything. So... Remember that these big three have a lot of oomph behind them. And, you know, the problem with them is getting them to shift to electrification, right? They've been slow in acting, and I get it. And, you know, that's why I'm glad that Tesla's making this noise and Rivian's making the noise to get them to think, you know, we need to change this marketplace up and we need to go after it. So I'm really glad for that. Um, so, again, in summary, you know, for Tesla to change the, the, the design just to be different, to be out of this world... That's their choosing. As I said, you know, the, the, the lack of modularity uh, in the design that they're offering, I think will limit the amount of the market potential that they can go after, right? So if I, you know, people were saying about the specs versus the Ford 150. Well, if I look at the ICE V versions of some of the pickup trucks today, and if I look at towing capacity, the, the long range uh, Cybertruck, the tri-motor is a 14,000 pound towing capacity. Um, the F-250 and the F-350 are 18,500 and 32,000 pounds, respectively. When you look at off-road vehicles, the Cybertruck is very impressive with a 16-inch ground clearance. It's the second highest in a list of, of top 10 that I have here. The first highest being the Mercedes-Benz uh, G550 4x4. Now, that's, that's a very expensive vehicle, so Tesla does quite well. The next closest thing would be the F-150 Raptor at uh, 11 and a half inches of ground clearance. Uh, when you look at approach and departure angles, though, you know, there's a lot that are actually better than the Tesla, but with a lower ground clearance. So, again, you know, there are competitive products out there. So I'm not I'm not trying to push the um, merits of ice fee vehicles against the Tesla. There's there's lots of benefits, right? The, the downsides are typically price and range, right? When you compare them to ice fee uh, cost parity and we just don't have the same ranges available. But in most cases, you don't need those kind of ranges in daily use. So so a, a big enough battery fits. I'm going to stop it there because I've got more information that I could add to this. But I'm hoping that you guys try to understand where I'm coming from and that Ford, at least Ford and GMC, you know, at least the first two of the big three are going to go into that uh, realm. And I, I believe they're going to have pretty compelling offerings. But I think because of the... The versatility in the in the um, cab on frame approach, um, Ford and the other guys that stick with that will be able to offer a lot more. 
You got a Cybertruck on order, you want to get one, you want to get one for your business, great, that's fantastic. So hopefully that um, gets everybody up to a speed of what I was thinking up. So uh, if you've got more negative comments, you can certainly send them in again. But, you know, as I said in the last show, I love Tesla. I'm a big supporter of Tesla. I'm just trying to be a realist here and bring things down into into a perspective. And um, we'll wait and see what, else, what, what the others come out. It will be an exciting time. All right, so let me continue on with the, the, the main show part. And let's keep the pickup truck frame, uh, uh, theme because GM did announce that they're going to come out with a fully electrified GM, uh, GMC electric truck by the fall of 2021, uh, which is in line with uh, around, you know, Tesla's time frame of later 2021 or early 2022. No specs, basically, other than um, GM's um, CEO, Mary Barra, just confirming that they are going to do something um, there is going to be a very capable truck. They're going to look, you know, obviously look at the skateboard design and modulizing it. They have a global architecture. They have a supply chain for batteries and all this kind of stuff. Good that GM's finally stepped up and said, something's coming. Wait, folks, it's coming. It's going to be something that we're used to, that you're used to seeing from us. Uh, so stay tuned on that one. Now, I mentioned Rivian at the top, and I'm excited to be, actually, when I go down the fully charge later on, uh, early next year, Rivian will be there, and I'm excited to be able to see them. They've, obviously, you folks have, have followed the Rivian story, know that Ford is a partner with Rivian, that they put in $500 million to the company. Well, it looks like that partnership is going to yield some results of Rivian using their platform to build a Lincoln, a Lincoln electric SUV all electric SUV to arrive sometime in 2022. No, no pricing or anything. Um, it's supposed to be uh, based on the Mach-E platform, but I have a feeling because of the bigger size that that's why they're incorporating the Rivian based model uh, because they want a more larger SUV that's going to be, you know, offer some more traditional truck attributes. And there are, you know, those big eight passenger SUVs out there and there's a need for that. So um, n not really a lot of details on this other than there's there's an assumption that this is going to happen. Hopefully we'll hear more information on that soon. And uh, when I do, I will let you know. Now, I talked about mass transit and busing in the last show and I will be coming up with a more in-depth look at that in the, in the next show or two. So stay tuned for that. But a couple more uh, articles popped after the last show. Brisbane and the city of Brisbane in Australia is ordering 60 electric buses from a um, Swiss company. Um, Hess called Hess and uh, in partnership with Volgren from Australia. These are articulated buses holding about 150 to 180 passengers. Uh, should be, um, they're going to start testing in the latter part of 2020 and then in regular service by 2023. So again, great to see the mass transit adoption. And sticking with that theme of mass transit, um, a, a really great article came out just after the last show about the US um, FTA awarding four, over $400 million for a lot of, a lot of electrified transit projects. The, and the FTA is the Federal Transit Administration in the US and they have this grant program uh, of over 400 million that they are funding 90 to four projects in 42 of the US states. Many of these projects have to do with electric busing and charging infrastructure, so that's great. Some funds range from a few thousand up to millions, depending on the case. Um, here's a, an example of one of the larger projects coming from Arizona, where they're going to receive over $17 million to construct a new connection center, as well as acquire electric buses. Um, 11 of the 42 projects actually identified aim to establish electric infrastructure and transportation routes. Um, the majority aim to update outdated public transportation and bus facilities, and all that kind of stuff. So, again, another and I'm very surprised to see this, especially with the current administration that's in Washington for this to actually come out and, and hit the ground running and be real. So, uh, you know, if you're in an area that's uh, in a municipality or a region or, or a business that's taking advantage of this, uh, let me know. I'd love to hear from you. But it's great to see that more dollars are being poured into this type of marketplace, the mass transit, you know, in an upcoming show. I'll tell you how important that really is. Couple quick car update uh, news. Uh, Fisker, they're still moving forward. Um, they're now accepting reservations for the Fisker Ocean, their SUV vehicle. It is a beautifully stunning vehicle, very nice. Um, only limited models will be sold. We don't know how many yet that they're going to want to uh, 
that they're going to build, but they are taking pre-orders now. They're going to be pushing leasing quite heavily, uh, whether whether it's through their own finance or through a partnership, I, I don't 100% know. Um, but you'll be able to get one of these for as low as 379 bucks US a month or 345 euros. Take your pick on that. Um, that's pretty good. It's talking about an SUV, elect all electric SUV, that's less than $40,000 US. Um, but I'm sure you can tack on options. Now, they're going to do an official launch of this on January 4th of next year, so just in a month or so. So it'll be exciting to see what they actually come out with and all the, the specs. I'm glad that they're moving forward, and if anybody's got a reservation and gets updated information, please let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Quick announcement from Lexus over the week. They finally have entered the all-electric game. You know, they've been pushing hybrids and plug-ins for a bit with a crossover called the UX300e. Um, it's their first move into that electrification realm. Um, it's kind of based on a UX uh, of its UX compact luxury crossover vehicle. It's got a f just under 55 kilowatt hour battery pack, um, 400 kilometer, 248 miles of range they're talking about. I don't, I don't know if this is WLTP or ETPA, it doesn't say. 150 kilowatt, 201 horsepower motor, uh, 300 newton meters or 221 pound feet of torque. So really nice get up and go. Uh, those are some of the specs. Um, the disappointing news, I think, from this is that the car, this vehicle will go on sale first in China and Europe starting next year. So that's good that the program's accelerated a bit. And then it'll move to Japan in early 2021 but there's no other word about other marketplaces. And it would really be nice to see this come to North America. Um, I think it would do quite well. And, um, you know, uh, who knows, in Australia and, and other places, right, that are looking for electrification. So uh, wait and see. Things may change on that. But I am glad, again, as I always say, that more choice is better. And as we continue to add more models and more manufacturers to the EV lineup, it'll be better for consumers. And finally, for my last story in this show, something different. And this is a great, great story that I picked up. I had to read it over a few times to really kind of let it sit in and, and, and really uh, kind of uh, explore the significance of this. But it's, it's a, um, it's a, it's a multi-use type of vehicle, which in my opinion, and in the story, you know, expresses that it's much more fascinating than the Cybertruck. I would agree with this. This is to do with the heavy-duty equipment marketplace. And if anybody's familiar with that, we see heavy-duty equipment, I'm sure you, on your daily drive to work, especially in a major urban area or metropolitan area, you will see heavy equipment vehicles from anything from snow plows to backhoes to, um, you know, all kinds of different machines, right? Uh, guys, uh, it, 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 there's a lot of these platforms and they're all diesel engine based, right? They're all burning this uh, this bad diesel and putting smoke out there. So there's a company in Muncie, Indiana called Dinar. And Dinar is, um, has come to market with this ingenious approach of an electric heavy duty equipment where it can be almost anything. So it's a single platform that's very modular that can be modified to do a number of different jobs. It's uh, their flagship product, as you're seeing pictures and video here, the Danar 4.00. It can accept over 250 attachments uh, from guys like Cat, John Deere, Bobcat, all these guys that already have stuff out there today, which is great. And because of, of its skateboard-like simple platform, a lot of this attachment work owners, operators can do themselves, like some of them do today, right? They use a pickup truck as a snow plow in the winter, and then they use it as something else in the summer or whatever with attachments. So you can do these, these changes in very little time. And this is a one vehicle, many machine types of solution, which I think is brilliant. So it could be a backhoe, it could be a snow plow, as I mentioned, um, many, many different types. You could change it up. In, in various applications. So I think, you know, the article references is that this is a huge win for municipalities that are having tough times with budgets because of the interoperability and the interchangeability that this offers. You could buy a small fleet and equip this with various levels of, uh, of equipment for the needs that you have at, at, at that time. Um, so that's great. You know, rather than buying a backhoe and it sits for four months of the year or five months of the year, you've made this investment and you have to store it and it, it just sits there. Now, unlike diesel equipment, this uh, rig only uh, requires about two hours of annual maintenance. So that's from an OPEX perspective, that's incredible, right? Never mind just the electricity part of it. Um, but wait, as we say on those TV commercials, there's more. 
Um, this can also be a mobile power source. How brilliant is that? So, you know, when there's a storm or a power outage, you know, I feel for, for you folks recently in California that went through the fires and had to go through these roaming blackouts. Um, this thing can be dispatched to provide electricity to uh, areas without power. And you can tie multiple of these units together to build your own microgrid of power. And there's even you can get a solar canopy to boost, so, you know, charging from solar on that to boost its sustainability. Um, it, it's a brilliant design. Now, and the other part of this is that they use battery packs from the BMW i3. The standard model comes with three 42 kilowatt hour battery packs for a total of 126 kilowatt hours. And it's expandable up to 625 kilowatt hours per machine. Per machine folks so you could get eight of ten eight to ten hours of operation on average for these kind of machines depending on what you're doing and i mean just think of it you can you can be plowing uh, streets or tilling fields or whatever the case is or you could be powering a cell tower for 12 days um you know they're they're in the case of a blackout when you're using these as power um, uh, sources um, they have a power export panel. It's, it's, it's capable of being configured with multiple 110 VAC or 208 VAC outlets. You can also charge this through CCS at 60 kilowatts. So that's pretty cool as well. Uh, so this can be another use that they're talking about is mobile charging stations for EVs. You know, you could you, municipalities can have these and they can send it out to areas at, like emergency equipment. It's a fantastic idea. It's a third... Um, by the way, this is a, a zero emission 13,000 pound vehicle and it has a towing capacity of, get this, wait, there's more again, 600,000 pounds. Wow. And it can be equipped as a forklift and has a 13,000 pound lift capacity. Um, it can also be submerged for up to four feet in water. It has four wheel drive and four wheel independent steering on this thing. So you can turn on a dime and, you know, I, I'm going to stop there with all the specs because as I continue to read about this, this unique offering, I, my mind was just starting to be blown away and melting. So, you know, this is a fantastic use case of uh, an all electric solution that can go after many, many, many marketplaces and serve multiple jobs and uses. And I wish this company all the best. Um, you know, if, if you're connected to your, your, your local uh, county, municipality, whatever, you know, state region you're in, country you're in, talk about these things to these guys because they probably don't know. Let them know that this stuff is coming. Start investigating. Start looking into this because, you know, the OPEX, there's no pricing on this and I'm sure because of the myriad of, of different configurations, it's going to be not cheap. But when you again, when you look at the OPEX and the versatility, I don't have to buy three machines or five machines. I can buy one, get some cheaper attachments to do the job of those and save myself money on upfront um, capex pricing and then as i use those those uh, those uh, these machines over time the opex can be a lot lower and save money so great great use case uh, i'm really really uh, stoked to see these guys come up with something that i never thought of before but it is a very vital marketplace and of course i wish them all the best well, finally, folks, that's it for this episode 70. I probably went a little longer than I wanted to, but, you know, there's some things I wanted to get off my chest there um, and get out to you guys. And thank you for, for stay, sticking with me throughout this show. I always appreciate you watching and for uh, comments, uh, likes, dislikes. I mean, last show, I, I got more dislikes probably, I think, for that show than I have got in any of the other shows as well. Hey, I knew it was going to happen. Uh, you know, uh, if you... I'm not one of those guys that's afraid to, to speak my mind about Tesla or any other company if, and if people don't like it, well, it's unfortunate that you're not seeing the big picture in, in the whole viewpoint because as I've mentioned before many times, one company is not going to solve the greenhouse gas emissions issue that we have affecting climate change. Um, one companies can't do that. They just can't produce enough vehicles to affect the change. We need millions and millions of these uh, of vehicles turned into EVs. And Tesla, unfortunately, is not big enough to do it on their own. So please look outside the box, folks. So thanks for that. Always a humble thanks for Patreon supporters. Um, always continue to be thankful and blessed that you are supporting me. If you're interested in supporting me, I would really much appreciate it. You can check out the website for more details. Don't forget Fully Charged Live again coming up uh, in about two months now. It's coming up pretty quick. 15% uh, savings by using my code as you see, case sensitive there. I'm looking forward to it. They just uh, released some announcements. 
uh, about who's there. Uh, EV Rep Show is on there. I'm glad that they, <laughs> they put me on the list there. So uh, I should have a little table or a little corner that I could hide in somewhere there. But no, please, if you're going down, search me out. I want to meet and talk to as many people as I can. Uh, I love the, the sharing of stories and being able to answer questions and provide some viewpoints that might help you in your decisions for an electric vehicle or other other things that you're looking at. So appreciate um, Fully Charged coming up with that. And I think that's about it. Again, uh, thank you very much for watching and taking the time out of your busy schedules to stick with me in the show uh, as I continue to ramp up. Again, in the next couple of weeks, I'll come up with something a little bit more focused on that busing stuff that I've been alluding to. Uh, so that'll be exciting. And until the next show, then, please, everybody stay safe. Um, you know, winter's coming now, all these storms. Uh, it's, that, it's that time of year. So stay safe, and I'll see you when I see you. Take care. Bye-bye.